All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have been given the thumbs up. So now is the time to grab a seat. It's great to see everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the summer program of the North Braintree Civic Association. Summer. Memorial Day is over, and here we are. It's technically summer. The MBCA is a group of citizens who simply fight for the neighborhoods. We're not a social club. We come out when needed. We enjoy the fellowship of being with one another, and we enjoy being able to be here at events like this as few of them as possible. My name's Kelly Moore. I'm the president of the North Braintree Civic Association. I'd like to run through a few house rules um, items before we start. At the tables in the back, and we have Lori Cassignetti and her crew back there. Hi, Lori. Um, she's doing a wonderful job. We have membership forms for anybody who would like to join the North Braintree Civic Association. Please see Lori and the crew back there. We also have amazing and sexy North Braintree Civic Association stickers. Yeah, that's me. Uh, we have people out in the parking lot putting them on your cars right now, so you don't have to worry about even picking one up. But if you would like one, uh, they're over there in the back table. Uh, if you have any questions as we go for any of the speakers, we're not doing the raise your hand thing, we're doing the card thing. So if you have a question for a speaker, we have our ushers who are, our, we have Alan Flowers and Seamus Healy. Raise your hands, you guys, will, they're the sexy guys walking around with cards in their hands. They're ushers, raise your hand if you have a question that's the most effective way of getting questions answered. Any questions? Okay, never mind. Our agenda tonight, uh, we're going to start out with a special presentation to the Salloways. We'll move to the mayor. He has some town updates. Mr. Kakoris is in our midst right over here. Uh, then we have John Donovan with us from the Braintree Historical Society who's going to do a presentation on the plaque program. And that's kind of cool. It's so cool I decided to get a plaque on my house and there you go. Uh, we're going to have uh, a Clean Harbors update from Town Councilor Elizabeth Maglio, a Zom Monster Project update with Steve Sasha. We're going to have Julia Flaherty, who's on this agenda, but not seen, unfortunately. But Julia Flaherty is going to be speaking actually before Steve Sasha. Counselor Julia Flaherty, thank you. Then we're going to have the master plan input, which is going to be towards the end. We're going to take some time talking through some of the master plan project items, and that will be led by uh, Vice President Liz Page and Jen Wadlin. And speaking of the Master Plan Steering Committee, we have four here with us. Uh, we have Liz and Jen, and we also have Amy Holmes. So that's pretty exciting. And then, sorry, what? Oh, Julia. We're going to need to talk after this, I think. She's going to tap me on the shoulder. So that's our agenda, and then after that, we will have some closing comments, as few of those as possible. Clear as mud? Excellent. So I want to thank Billy and Jerry with BCAM. They're back in the back room making sure this thing goes flawlessly, and they've already failed because I'm up here, so there you go. Um, and they're doing great work. So, that being said, I'd like to say a few words about the Salloways who live on Cachedo Road. The Salloways have been in the neighborhood for more than 40 years. 
They have been staunch supporters of the Civic Association. They've been just very consistent in everything they've done, except they are both sick tonight. He was in the hospital, he had a doctor's appointment pretty much all day, so they're at home resting up. So I'd like to actually have a round of applause for the Salloways. This will be... <laughs> this is being recorded. I told them that they're going to be mentioned, and so there you go, Rich and Josephine. Next, I'd like to ask the mayor to come on up and share a few updates that he has. Mayor Kikoris. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome, North Branch Civic Association. Um, this, uh, I remember years ago when I was a counselor and um, much of the uh, Civic Association was located within my uh, district. We had a lot smaller meetings upstairs, so it's really great to see so many uh, people participating. Um, so last night, just an update, last night we uh, had our annual town meeting and um, our budget, budget that I presented of $160,405,001 was um, approved by the council. So um, we have fully funded uh, fiscal year 24 and will maintain uh, the highest level of services um, as expected. And just talk a little bit about the schools. Uh, we uh, spend a little bit over 50% on our school budget and we remain committed to uh, funding our schools, our students and our educators uh, as well. In the area of schools, for the first time um, we're building and we're almost done building our first brand new school since the new high school, which I went to when it was fairly new. And um, it's the new South Middle School. And it is um, on budget and on time. And uh, we just took a walk through the other day and it, it just looks beautiful. So we're very happy about that. And that was part of the debt exclusion that you all voted for um, in September, I think it was September 26th of 2020. And what that allowed us to do, um, as I made my way through Braintree and looked at all of our buildings, um, looked at our school buildings, it, it helped us not only uh, build this new school, but also uh, we, put, we uh, put money in there for our roofs on elementary schools. So we have this summer, we have four elementary schools, Flaherty, um, Hollis, Highlands, and Liberty that are, go are going to get brand new roofs. And parlaying into that, We've combined facilities. Uh, it's, you know, it was a, a pretty big um, move on, on the town's behalf, but we combined our facilities, our school and town facilities. And when you look at this room, uh, and you look at how beautiful it, it is in, in town hall in general, that's because of our facilities department and how the great work that they've done. So that's our goal with our school buildings. And we've already seen some uh, major repairs done and we've invested in um, asbestos abatement and some other um, critical areas of school maintenance. So um, it's, it's important uh, to, for me to also mention that we are making security improvements, which was part of the debt exclusion as well. So all of those things within our schools and our school facilities uh, are being accomplished right now. Another thing that's interesting, and in, in the Civic Association especially understands this, is a few years ago we did some analysis in neighborhoods and talked about you know, cut through traffic and people speeding and not paying attention to the lights in Braintree Square and other places. Um, so for the, for the first time in many years, we are funding a traffic division. So when you call my office and say there's an issue with speeding on my street, it gives us the opportunity to deploy that traffic division and to um, prevent people from speeding by uh, having police presence. It's something that we've been talking about for a number of years and um, we're, we're doing that this year. And, you know, as well, uh, we've 
really um, put a lot of work on our school resource officer, so we are adding a school resource officer, and uh, that will help, help out the schools a lot as well. And as far as our uh, fire department, we have, uh, we're in the process of doing the renovations. We've been talking about it for, I don't know, maybe a decade. And there's been a piecemeal financing, a piecemeal approvals of bonding. And we are currently uh, at the point where uh, we are in the final stages of design. So we should be going out to bid shortly within this year, uh, maybe sometime in the late summer or fall. And that'll allow us to do renovations of um, our fire station, which I don't know if any of you have seen, seen it in person or seen pictures. There's been some newspaper stories done on it over the years, and it's really in rough shape. And uh, it's great to have that being taken care of. Um, and as far as um, the, some of the savings that we realized in, in um, partnering with um, the Historical Society is they had a, the, the old Galvin house across the street and got into a conversation with them about potentially us going in there and utilizing it for dorms uh, while, the, while the fire station was being um, renovated. And we um, agreed that it was a good idea to do that and it's been uh, modified and it's been upgraded so that our firefighters can use it uh, during that period of time. Saved us a lot of money and it gives the Historical Society um, a newly renovated um, interior of the Galvin House. As far as uh, new revenue sources, um, I'll, I'll just go over some of the things. Um, 400 Wood Road, which was a former ham and attic site, was vacant when I took office. And um, they had left. And at the time, the one company that was most interested was Amazon. They wanted to do a distribution center. And met with the company owners, the building owners, and just told them that we did not want that there and we wouldn't support it. So we, our goal was to get life science to come to Braintree. And uh, we accomplished that. And the company is Integra and they're taking uh, a good portion of the building and they will add additional revenue, uh, new taxes. Um, we just received some significant um, uh, permit fees from them. And addition, in addition to that, the remainder of the building is approximately 50 to 57,000 square feet is uh, going to be occupied by another tenant. Um, that is in the process of putting the bids out for um, the uh, improvements in the building permitting fees. So it's a, it's a, it's a big improvement um, up on Wood Road and uh, it's our first life science company which is really exciting uh, to have come to Braintree. We, you know, have taken a look at a lot of our vacant properties out there that we own and one was Allen Street, so from the very beginning we put Allen Street out to bid, and uh, we were able to uh, not only through the, this period of time that we've been working on it, um, have Arch Wynn, who are the developers, uh, they're going to build 56 units, they're going to um, have affordability, they're going to create um, over, when it's complete and it's built, it'll put us over the 10% uh, that we've been striving for, for um, uh, for the 40B, and also um, this new development is a development that this property has never brought us any taxes in, and we're estimating approximately a $30 million project, which will bring in around 600,000 new taxes. Banner Park, originally, uh, when it was permitted, we were looking at life science, and there's been a shift to um, studio production facility, which um, this 272,000 square feet of, of new building that they will be building there. And Banner Park is um, certainly has a lot of great things um, connected to it. We're going to have uh, a dog park, our first dog park in Braintree, uh, built by the developer uh, at no cost to town, as well as um, acres and acres of walking trails um, on the site as well. And one of the uh, other projects down the street from there is the CVS on the corner of Libyan Grove, which is 
in the process of being built. Next door um, has been vacant for a long time, uh, back in the days when I was on the Water and Sewer Commission. That's where we um, operated out of for a while. And uh, the, the building has been closed for a couple of decades or more. And we were able to secure a grant to do a regional um, dispatch center uh, with Braintree Fire, Braintree Police, and Randolph Police and received $4 million to do the build out. And right now, um, the architect is doing the design plans and drawing them up. The significance of it is, is we're reusing a building, um, one of our vacant buildings, and at the same time, we're gonna create savings of anywhere from 750,000 to a million dollars a year. Because this grant, you apply for additional grants that allow you to uh, pay for the actual staffing and there's some over, there's a lot of overtime savings etc so it's a very it's a very good project and um, the other big project we have going on right now is the Tritown Regional Treatment Plant and we are um, in the process of building it and it's moving forward and should be built somewhere around 2025 and we have one of the things that had to be measured was a thing called PFAS, which are forever chemicals known to be connected to cancer. And essentially when, when we did the study, which we were required to, uh, we found that we had levels um, of a little bit over 20 parts per trillion. The federal level was 70 parts per trillion. So we immediately uh, came up with remediation and um, put in a filter system that would filter it out. So your water in Braintree um, is PFAS free. And when the new treatment plant is built, Holbrook and Randolph will also have PFAS free water because we'll have one treatment plant. And one of the um, agreements that was made between um, our communities was to uh, fund one police officer and two firefighters. Um, and that is, it has been put into the use agreement, which will uh, remain in, in place for 50 years. So there's a lot of uh, great things happening. Um, there's um, some other things in the mall that the Apple Store is expanding, and they're, they're moving the location and expanding, which is a good thing. Uh, there's another, um, they haven't come before us yet, but there's another business that involves some sort of golf simulators inside as well that looking to take a big chunk so it's a couple of a couple of things moving in there that you know we like to see um, obviously you know everybody uh, throughout town we see a lot of signs um, with a with an arrow through them a, a line through them and you know regarding the the development that is proposed there and you know I've been uh, openly opposed to it uh, just because of the fact that it's it's really the wrong place and um, as far as a density that w it would bring to the, to the area, not only would have uh, a high impact on the resident, residential neighborhood uh, that abuts the plaza and deals with all the things that the plaza brings, but also would put a real strain on our infrastructure. We have the Common Street Pump Station, which 20 something years ago when I was on Water and Sewer, we replaced it. It's getting near um, a point where it needs some major work and um, you know just the overall amount of water that would be used and and, and um, there is really no way for them to mitigate traffic onto the roads so there's a, there's a lot of um, questions and issues and I know it's been continued a few times and many of you that are here tonight have been at those meetings um, you know we've my staff has made a negative recommendation on it uh, it has to make its way from the planning board to the council, and then the council uh, from there would, would take a look at it because it's a zoning matter. So it would require a minimum of five votes. If vetoed, it would require six. So um, it's kind of right now in limbo. I don't know what that next move is, but I've, you know, um, I've talked about um, exactly how I feel about the project, and we'll see what happens from here. Um, so overall, uh, we, you know, in, in conclusion, as far as um, our free cash, we 
we're able to certify our free cash uh, at double, it was double the number it was in the previous year, um, from 4.2 to 8.5 million. We've utilized some of that money to uh, fund the 24 budget, and um, a couple of things that were in the 23 budget were one-time ARPA funds and um, what they call ESSER fund grants from the schools, which totaled about five million. So we're using approximately 4.2 million from our free cash. But the good news is that um, our anticipated free cash certification based on monies that we've already received in excess of the revenue projections and revenue sources that um, we budgeted for, uh, our number uh, is estimated to be at about 9.2 million um, at the end of 23's budget and certification sometime in the fall. So we are working uh, moving forward and um, I think that We've, we've seen some really good progress um, post-COVID and we'll continue to do so. And um, I thank you for uh, taking the time to listen to me and um, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions if you had any. Yes. Uh, Banner Park is the former location of the uh, mass lottery. So that building is still there and um, it's kind of up in the air as to whether uh, it was purchased by Mass General Brigham's, and it's, it's up in the air whether they're going to move forward with it or sell it or, or, or rent it. So that's another piece that uh, could be uh, utilized for some additional tax revenue as well. Sure. Yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay, that's right. Sorry. The question was, where is Banner Park? And Banner Park is located... Um, by the, where the old lottery was, lottery building was. So the status of the river walk on Middle Street is uh, we are moving forward and um, you know we should, I think it should be completed sometime in, um, by the fall. So it's, it's, it's moving forward right now. Yeah, and, you know, it's basically um, an opportunity for folks to uh, make their way down the Monadic River and, and really see some beautiful sights. But, um, you know, it's, it's taken some time to get through all of the um, conservation items, et cetera, and be built out. But, yeah, it's, it's, it'll be open to the public and available for people to uh, utilize. Yes. <laughs> yes. So the question is, the question is, um, what is the status on the Peterson Pool? So the Peterson Pool site is um, kind of in limbo at this point. Um, we have um, some litigation from the second contractor. So the original contractor did not uh, finish the job. It was uh, a lot. It was transferred over to another contractor who didn't perform. Uh, he's challenging the fact that uh, we moved on from him, and we do have uh, a, a company that Edge Sports Develis who built uh, the Thayer Rink, and uh, they, um, you know, uh, are, are the ones that we are working with to try to come to a, a lease agreement, and. You know, as far as um, the economy might have impacted things a little bit in supply chain, but we're not giving up on it. I mean, it's only been 60 years, but we're not giving up on it, right? So, I wish I could. I wish I could give you better news right now, but we're still working on that. Mike, okay. We have a mic. If anyone has any questions. Okay. Yeah. That's why we have index cards. Yep. Okay. So the question is, uh, is there any status on the Motel 6 site? Uh, the Motel 6 site was purchased by a company called Torrington, and they have proposed building a bank, Brookline Bank, and uh, they are in the process um, with planning, the planning board. Um, for a Chick-fil-A, 
Uh, it is a very challenging site, and the original engineer that was working for uh, the applicant, I, I think they've uh, hired someone else, and they have some revised plans, but certainly it's, um, it's underway. It's just a matter of uh, whether or not the traffic works. If it does, it does. If it doesn't, it doesn't, but something will be uh, built on that site, and currently um, the proposal is for Chick-fil-A and Brookline Bank, and um, the reason the buildings are still up, they did do removal of uh, asbestos and uh, some other things that they had to do, uh, but until they receive their permits, uh, they're not looking to take down the building, so they're in that process now. It was originally owned by a whole group of different people that couldn't come to terms on a sale, but finally uh, that happened um, maybe over a year ago now. Question? So we're, I mean, that's one of the, so the question is, as far as the Chick-fil-A, would they have to reconstruct the road and, and um, you know, there's, the, as far as the Chick-fil-A or any, any development, um, the engineers, uh, not only our town engineer, but the engineer that works for the firm um, that represents uh, the applicant, and then we have our own person that uh, reviews it as well. So whatever they have to do, whether they have to create additional lanes, whatever they have to do has to pass the test and, and make sure that the traffic is able to move. So it's, it's, uh, it's challenging for sure. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, business that tends to bring a lot of cars. So that's something that, you know, we'll make, sh make sure that we do our due diligence on our behalf, so. I've never had that check-in, so I, I don't know if it's any good, so. My kids get Chipotle all the time, so. <laughs> okay. I was told that my time is up, but thank you very much, I appreciate it. So uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just so everyone knows, historically, at every one of these meetings, we have the mayor speak. Uh, we did that with the previous mayor every single meeting as well. Now I'd like to introduce John Donovan, who is from the Braintree Historic Society. He is a volunteer, and we have other volunteers here from the Historic Society as well. If you're a volunteer from the Historic Society, please raise your hand. Oh, look at this. We're inundated. Before I ask John to come uh, to the podium, I'd like to also say that Councillor Stephen O'Brien has blessed us with his presence as well. So, Mr. Donovan, if you don't mind, why don't you come up and tell us what this is all about? John Donovan. Thank you, Kelly. Good evening, everyone. If you don't know about the Braintree Historical Society, it was formed in the 1930s when Braintree was getting ready for its 300th anniversary. Not only was Braintree getting ready, but old Braintree was getting ready. At the time when the town was formed, it was consisted of Quincy, Braintree, Randolph, and Holbrook. And we were among the first 10 towns in the entire state of Massachusetts. We're a private, nonprofit organization. We have no employees. It's all volunteer. In 1959, the society purchased the Sylvanius Thayer House in South Braintree and brought it across the street from Town Hall. Uh, and many of you know that for many years there was a very successful fifth grade uh, education program at that school. Uh, my two boys uh, went through that as well. Sylvanius Thayer, of course, was the founder of Thayer Academy and also uh, gave money to start the Brain Braintree Library, the Thayer Library. Uh, he was known as the father of West Point for his uh, innovative uh, s educational skills in redeveloping that organization back in the 1820s and 1830s. 
The Braintree Historical Society now owns the, not in addition to the Thayer House, a barn that was representative of uh, what Thayer grew up in Braintree in the 1720s. Uh, that barn has a uh, resource center associated and built onto it. The society also owns the French House, which is at the corner of Washington and Union Place, uh, that served at one time as the town's first post office. And we own the Galvin House, which is situated between the French House and the Thayer House. At one time, uh, Braintree Historical Society had over a thousand members. We probably have less than 200 now, and we have very few volunteers. Uh, I'll be available at the back of the room uh, with some membership forms if you're interested, and we are definitely looking for people who would uh, like to do some work for us. Now a little bit about the uh, plaque program. There's only 100 plaques so far in Braintree, so this is a relatively new program. Uh, this is what the plaques look like, and I'll pass it around. So you can take a look. The, um, the plaque is, uh, in order to produce the plaque, it's researched by volunteers at the Branger Historical Society. We start with looking at the deeds from Norfolk County to determine all the owners of the property, all the way back to the original owner, and, uh, and then we'd write up a, a biography of the various families who've lived in the home. So each plaque has on it the, the date when the home was first built, uh, as well as the family name, if known. The plaque, uh, some people ask this question, and it's a good one. The plaque is informational only. It doesn't change the legal status of your home. It doesn't prohibit you from making changes to your home. Uh, it's, it's not a, uh, a legal document. It's, it's really just informational. Uh, we currently uh, charge $99 for a plaque. Um, we uh, have a very simple eligibility. Your home just has to be more than 50 years old. And obviously in Braintree, there are many, many homes that qualify for that. So uh, we're interested in uh, uh, getting plaques out there in the community because that helps the historical society with visibility. And we need new members. We need members that are younger than uh, most of us who are pretty old. Every one of the persons that has got a plaque uh, in the last two years that I've dealt with has been very pleased with their results. Sometimes they're quite surprised, sometimes not. We just had a plaque that was, uh, uh, the home was over 100 years old and was in the same family, passed down from generation to generation. Uh, another home in North Braintree had 15 different home homeowners. Um, one family found out that the person who lived in the home originally manufactured automobiles in Braintree. The Dow Automobile Company uh, produced cars in the 1910-1912 era. And uh, just to follow up, um, Captain Augustus Pedersen was uh, one of the homes that has a house plaque. That, that home in East Braintree is owned by him. So I'll be available in the back if you want to talk about uh, joining the Historical Society, uh, or especially if you want to talk about a plaque, um, I'll be there. Thank you very much. I, uh, thank you, John. That was a uh, very thorough, very uh, good overview. He just handed me my house overview and it's 42 pages, okay? So they do their due diligence. The only problem is I mentioned in here only once, but my wife about 10 times. I don't know why that would be, but it's pretty impressive. I've also heard that if you put a plaque in your house, it immediately doubles the value, so you might want to check that out. Next, we have an update I'd like to call Liz. Come on up. Liz Maglio is a town councilor um, over in East Braintree, and we all know what happened there several months ago. 
and I've asked Liz to grace us with her presence and give us an overview of the Clean Harbors update. Councilor Maglio. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, everybody. It's nice to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm going to tell you three different things tonight. The first is a quick little overview of what happened. The second is our official steps that the community has taken to seek some environmental justice. And the third are the questions that we need answers to. Okay. So on February, of uh, 16th, a chemical fire raged on for three hours at Clean Harbors. The air quality monitors spiked while firefighters fought the fire. Um, they used their hoses to try and contain the blaze while it, um, in order to further prevent the spread of the fire. In this area, there's a lot of gas. There are gas tanks, there are gas canisters, there's an actual tank farm, there's an actual tanker that brings the gas in every week. That's the reason when you see the Four River Bridge raising, it's because a giant tanker full of gas is coming into the little uh, Four River Basin. What we were told, uh, oh, and the most important thing is that area is also surrounded by families, by me, my husband, my dogs, my neighbors, the kids, the grandparents, the cousins, uncles. This is in a very residential area in East Braintree. And it also impacts the families in Quincy and families in Weymouth. What we were pretty much told about our level of safety was don't worry about it. It'll be cleaned up. We'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. And to the community, at best, at best, that's sloppy. But at worst, it's not truthful. And given the kind of information that has come out in reports since then, it's trending toward the worst, the not truthful part. Three very specific issues. The major issues is that the spike in air quality went up. There's no denying it. Everybody saw it, it was captured on air quality monitors, it's been written in every single article, every single reporter, every single op-ed. It's undeniable, except if you decide to measure it in your own newfangled way is where you come up with the fact that it really wasn't that bad because when you average the spike over 24 hours, it becomes less of a spike. So that's like saying if you get shot at 11, you're safe at midnight and you're safe at 10. It's just 11 where there was a little bit of danger. And that is how the community of East Braintree has been treated for many decades. That's one issue, the air quality. The second is the firefighting water. Gallons and gallons, hundreds of gallons, hundreds of thousands of gallons of gas, of water was used to try and contain the flames. Because if the flames continued to spread due to the hydrants not working and the hoses not being long enough and the, uh, the, the, uh, the trailers not being labeled correctly, etc., cetera, um, the firefighters were facing a really dangerous threat because if, this con if the fire continued to hop from trailer to trailer with all of that gas around, the entire Four River Basin, East Braintree, would be nothing but a catered catastrophe. We would all have been vaporized. So that's the second issue is, what about all that water with the chemicals in it? And the third is the soil contamination, because when you're having chemicals, hazardous chemicals, being treated with water, which is not what they're supposed to be treated with, but there were no proper flame um, prevention materials, when you have a fire that it, when you have water that is treating chemicals, then those chemicals remain in the water. And water goes everywhere, as we all know. And water contaminates. Water can contaminate other water, and it contaminates the soil. So that was the situation that we woke up to. 
Friday morning after the fire. And that's a situation that we've been dealing with ever since. Now, our official steps to seek environmental justice are basically under Massachusetts Superfund laws, which says that contaminated properties must be investigated and cleaned up in a way that satisfies the concerns of the communities in which they are located. So this means residents of East Braintree, North Weymouth, and South Quincy can be formally involved and informed as to what steps are being taken to eliminate the contamination. It's a formal process for involvement. It starts with the petition. The petition must be signed by at least 10 parties and it requests official designation, which is called the Public Involvement Plan. Two petitions were submitted in March. I'm a signer of both petitions and what that allows us to do is to have public meetings where the state officials and the companies have to meet with residents and answer our questions. And all of these meetings are on the record. And this is all monitored by the Department of Environmental Protection, by their LSAPs. They have to foot for the bill. They have to foot the bill for all of this. And this is a process that we have decided to, to jump into with both, both feet. Um, why are we doing two processes? Well, Sitco had an oil spill, interestingly enough, the night before the fire. This was never revealed to us. All these meetings, many of you probably watched, some of you I know were here. We sat here, we listened to the companies, we listened to the state agencies, we listened to the, everybody from DEP wringing their hands, telling us how sorry they are. But what they didn't tell us is that there was an oil spill the night before, right into the water. What they also didn't tell us is that the fire water was not contained. And how did we find this out? Because of this public involvement plan and this process. So this is why this process is so important. It prevents powerful corporations and state agencies from dismissing the needs of residents who are impacted by accidental or careless contamination. It's a technical process, it's a legal process, it helps us hold clean harbors accountable for the chemical fire and the fire water. It helps us hold Sitco accountable for the oil spill that happened the day before. And it also shines a light on the firefighting water that eventually went back and forth. The water went over to the Sitco site, it went through the Sitco's gas and water separator machines, which empty right out into the Four River Basin. The basin where some people swim, kayak, fish, let their dogs run, etc. And then it shipped it right back over to Clean Harbors. And so now Clean Harbors and Sitco are fighting about how much damage there was from the firefighter water because whoever's responsible for that has a big cleanup on their hands. It also digs deeper into why the Mass Department of Environmental Protection has not been a more stringent protector of public health and safety. And that's probably the most heartbreaking element of all of this, is that the state agencies that we trust to protect us, to, to look out for the, the threats to where we live and where we work, and where we play and where we plant our gardens. We expect them to actually do their job and protect us. We don't expect them to come to a, a recorded, on the record, town council meeting and tell us it's all fine, when it's not. So the questions that we want answered through this public, improve, uh, public involvement process, the PIP process, are quite a few, but also very specific, and I'll just touch upon some of the key ones. First of all, where is the official written response from Clean Harbors to the two public hearings of the Braintree Town Council? We have volumes of questions and materials that we've asked them for. They need to give us written responses. Why are Clean Harbors and Sitco going back and forth about the contaminated fire water? What about the rest of the basin, finding out the status of that water and how much contamination is in it. How much fire water spread to Sitco, entered their stormwater management system, and how much of that went directly into the Four River? Stop telling us it didn't, when your own reports that they filed on their own websites say that it did. Because what they say is different than what is posted and put on the record. 
How many gallons of firefighter were used to fight the fire? We don't want an estimate. All we've gotten are estimates. We want to know how many gallons were used to fight the fire and how many gallons were recovered. When you subtract it, and then you have the total. Why can't we get the total? Why is it an, uh, well, I think it's this. Mm -mm. These are dangerous, flammable chemicals. Figure it out. How many gallons of Sitco fuel was spilled into the Four River the night before the Clean Harbors fire? What kind of protocols has DEP approved regarding containing the fire water? And where is the paper trail? The paper trail is very spotty. We get a little bit of information, and then all of a sudden, there's something's not referred to again, and then we look at another report and we get more information. Um, what about the cobalt carbonyl? Why was it shipped in a plastic container? Anybody can look up the safety transport information that says it needs to be under a certain temperature and it needs to, be, it needs to have inert gas that is protecting it. This was just dumped into the, this was in some plastic container thrown on the back of a trailer. These trailers, by the way, that come through town every day, many of them, as they pull in and out of my neighborhood and drop their cargo off and what are those drivers driving? Do they even know the risks? Do the other people at the plant even know the risks? Who's in responsible for looking at what's going into these trucks? And where is that accountability? How many permit violations were actually issued against the company who, who was so irresponsible with their chemical flammable waste? What precautions have, been, have, have taken place since then? All we've heard is, well, we're not doing things the same way. We've changed things. We're not moving things from one trailer to another. Sorry, that's not enough. We need to know how many, how many times is something checked? How many, how many trainings have taken place? What other kinds of protocols have been involved to protect everyone's safety? What is the process for safely approving and accepting these types of waste products every day? Where are the enforcement action records regarding the company that sent those materials? Why has there been no soil samples taken in the community? What about some sediment samples in the water? And who is taking responsibility for the release that was noticed over the course of a few days, the week following the oil spill and the chemical fire, it was described as a milky white substance rising from the basin. Clean Harbors, Sitco, and DEP all watched it. They all put it into their reports, but they neglected to inform us during any of the hearings in February or March. So what we have as a bottom line here is that the callousness of DEP and others toward the Four River Basin and toward this community and others is unacceptable. And we're going full force ahead to get every bit of accountability that we can get. And so I appreciate this opportunity to talk about some of these real issues. It's pretty key to, um, to, to getting resolution. Uh, this stuff is pretty confusing. It's been a steep learning curve for me. I am not a science type, um, but breaking it down and putting this information out in hopes that people will remember this and will um, keep an eye out for other kinds of opportunities to promote safety and to protect our environment um, is part of how we as a community can, can make a difference. So thank you very much for being able to talk about this. Thanks. Thank you. Wow. Tell you what, we're really running slim on time. So you can write it down. She has her, you can get her on email. But we actually have a lot more to go. But thank you, Liz. I appreciate it. Uh, I got to know Liz uh, when I saw her husband out here in the parking lot uh, wearing a hat with an M on it, which means Michigan. And we're not fans of Michigan when we're Ohio State fans. So he also now has an Ohio State hat, too. Now, he didn't know it meant Michigan, actually. He thought it meant Maglio. So that's why he has an M on his hat. So there's that. Um, our next speaker is Julia Flaherty. Well, we got something right. Uh, District 1 Town Counselor. Julia, thank you.
Good evening. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, it's a beautiful day outside, and I'm so glad to see all of you here. I know that there's a lot of things that you could be doing outdoors, but you decided to come here and, you know, kind of keep tabs on the things that are going on in the town, and I cannot tell you how really important that is to do. Um, it's, it's essential and uh, for residents to be engaged in what's happening across town, and I'm glad to see you here today. And I'm also thankful to have been invited to come and talk to you. Uh, I was asked to speak about the uh, housing proposal that has been put forward by ZOM um, adjacent to the plaza, and I imagine that some of you, most of you, are have some level of familiarity with what has been proposed. And um, I have put forward my own thoughts about it publicly in the past, which maybe you're familiar with, but I'm just going to share with you, you know, my impression of the development and uh, how I arrived at that and some thoughts about what we can do going forward. Um, so I guess the first thing I'll say is that the area that the proposal is uh, meant to be built upon has been a source of friction between the plaza and the community for a long time. Um, you know, in 2019, there was a uh, proposal for a, a golf entertainment complex that was met with a lot of resistance also. So I was not at all surprised to, to see, you know, a, a swell of opposition to this as well. Uh, but Braintree is not really very well positioned to just dismiss things out of hand. And um, Zom is a very well-regarded developer. And so I set about the business of listening to what was being proposed and reading the ordinance that was proposed and the economic impact paperwork and looking at the plans and talking to residents. And that's a lengthy process. Uh, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot. You always learn a lot when you're a, when you're a counselor. Uh, you can't help it. You're asked to have an opinion on everything. And if you're like me, you don't want to have an opinion until you know something about it. Um, but at any rate, here the conclusion that I've put forward is, you know, first of all, that this is not a proposal that, as it stands, I can support because it's not something that the community can support. And the basic reasons are this. The first, the first thing is to do with scale. Uh, the original proposal was 495 units at a level of five stories, and that makes a lot of sense when you're paying attention just to the plaza property that it's meant to be adjacent to, but it does not make that much sense when you're thinking about the single-family detached housing development that it is also adjacent to. And as a member of the Master Plan Steering Committee, it's been really interesting to confront this proposition at a time when Braintree is very carefully going through a process to try and deliberately move forward in a direction that we can agree on. And that's not an easy process because it turns out we do not all agree. But it's not an impossible process either. And we came forward, we came up with some, um, what I think are very carefully thought out like a foundation, this, these guiding principles that we arrived at. And one of these, and I'm not going to quote it precisely because I don't have it in front of me, but the basic gist of it, and the most relevant of them, is that new development will be harmonious in scale within the context of the surrounding community. And that means more than just one side of the community. It means both sides. It means the plaza and also the neighborhood. And that's a really difficult bar to reach and you can't reach it with 495 units at five stories. So, but I'm not very good at envisioning things spatially, just because you tell me something is 495 units and it's gonna be five stories tall, doesn't mean I necessarily have a firm sense of what that really means. So in order to arrive at one, uh, I went out to the elevation apartments, which are in Quincy. You can see them from the highway, they are at the split, um, and I'd never been up to see them up close before, but I'd seen them from the highway. They have the, almost exactly the same number of units. Um, so I went up and looked. And they are nice. Like, I would totally live there. Uh, but they're huge. And it is also not lost on me that they're built on mm, almost, well, maybe twice as much land as these were planned, are planned to be built on. So the 
overall experience of that property would be a giant block of retail, because that's what the mall represents, and then a giant block of housing behind it. Um, they're not shaped like squares. They're sort of shaped like two structures in the, in the shape of an E, a, a capital letter E, if you will. But um, overall, the scale was you know, one of the first concerns. And the second concern is that um, the affordability levels that were proposed are 10%. Now, we don't have an inclusionary bylaw in Braintree at present, um, but we should. And there's one that's under, that's been proposed, and that one has any structure, any new development at that level of density would have 15% inclusionary housing. And I, I think that Braintree needs affordable housing. And uh, so 10% just is not enough. Um, and the next problem had to do with open space. So one of the components of this proposal that was touted by the developers and which had a lot of appeal to me personally was the idea that it was going to bring some, you know, landscaped open space to us. And North Braintree has been identified in 2019, the uh, open space and recreation report that was also a community uh, engagement project. North Braintree was identified as a part of Braintree that needs additional open space. So that was an idea that made a lot of sense to me. If it could be executed like that, then I would listen to that. Um, but then, although the plans will show you something like 33% of the property being left as open space, what became clear in the end, um, upon further review, was that a very large portion of that was going to be open space that would be accessible to residents only, like the barbecue area and the pool area, like they were counting everything right up to the potted plant next to their front door. That's legal. That's not cheating. It's completely legal. But it's not what I think of as a promise of open space that would be available to the public, which is what is needed in that area. So, I, you know, it seemed disingenuous to me that they would call that 33% um, a use as far as this, the, the zoning maneuver is called a planned unit development. And one of the things that you have to have for a planned unit development is two acceptable uses. Because the idea of a planned unit development is meant to be something that encourages mixed use property, which this isn't really, because mostly it's just residential. So they've got the one use but they don't have a second. They're casting around for that, and open space is what they landed on. But I just don't think that a pool area with a barbecue space and a potted plant next to the door that is perhaps visible to the community, but certainly not something that the community can enjoy, constitutes a use, because it's only a use that can be availed, that's available to the people who live there. Um, there is an easy way to do this, and there's the right way to do this. Because any planner will tell you that housing is a smart thing to put next to um, retail. And the plaza, uh, certainly in my opinion, could use um, that kind of a support. But the easy way to do this is to take this piece of property that the plaza has never really known what to do with, because it's not zoned for what the plaza operates, you know, it's not zoned for retail, and sell it, and just avail themselves of the probably very substantial increase in value um, in the property since they purchased it, and make that profit, and then kind of be done with that piece of, of land. That's the easy thing for the plaza to do. But the right thing to do is to treat this need like a holistic require, you know, holistically, and to look at this outdated, outmoded m mode of, of retail that they currently employ, which is very 1992, and rethink it to meet the demands of today's consumer, which is not the same. They're competing with the internet. And even I know how to use Amazon on my phone, 
So, you know, if I can do it, any idiot can. And plenty of people do. So the, the council, not the council, the, uh, the plaza, when I spoke to them about doing this, um, you know, what they told me is that they consider the property a mature, developed property, which does not say to me that they are very interested at present in doing, in making a meaningful investment in that land. But, and you can kind of see that when you look at the way that the, 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 the way the property is planned right at present, because there's no connectivity between the housing and the plaza itself. If you lived there and you wanted to avail yourself of the amenities that the plaza has to offer, you would be immediately confronted with, I don't know, a football field's worth or more of unshaded, unsheltered parking lot. So I don't have a, a particular design in mind that, you know, because I'm not an architect and I'm also not an urban planner and I'm not even a property owner behind, beyond the, my own house. But I think that they can do it better and make, it in, make the housing better integrated with the plaza. It's just that they can't do that without making a substantial investment in the property beyond just selling off what they have. Um, so those are my thoughts about ZOM. I know that Stephen Shasha has uh, also things to say. So I, I will, you know, kind of step aside and let him share what he has to share with you. Thank you so much for letting me talk. Should anyone want to avail themselves, you can go on the internet and bid on this one sign. We'll sign it for you. No. We have many of these signs. If you would like one of these signs for your front yard, which many patriotic citizens have done, and some have been stolen, I've heard. We have a sign-up sheet back there. Uh, you can get your own Stop the Monster Project sign, and we will plant it in your yard. Yes, we will send out our sign planter to your yard and he looks a lot like me. <laughs> so who has my sheet? Uh -huh. So, you know, I can't get at, that upset at you, Julia, because I, did, I left you off the front agenda. But we did have a nice picture of you. So uh, you want to see it? It's right there. So proof. There you go. All right. Uh, so I've asked. Uh, Steve Shasha to come and give an update on the Zom Monster Project and what we've been able to deduce. Now we equals he. So Mr. Shasha. Hi, thank you everyone. Um, so I'm going to keep this very brief tonight. Um, I'm just going to go over a little bit kind of what's changed with this project since it was first introduced um, and then talk about the process and next steps. So uh, what you see in this picture is the original design for the project. The yellow line indicates the uh, parcel of land that Simon Properties is trying to sell to Zom in order to build this project. The red line indicates the buffer zone that the Braintree zoning bylaw requires Simon Properties to have. It's a 100-foot vegetated buffer between their property and uh, Flaherty School and the open space along the reservoir. Now, now way back, they got permission to uh, put parking spots in that buffer zone because they were pre-existing they do not have permission to build anything in that parking, in that buffer zone. But the easy way to get away with that is to write your own legislation. And so that's what they've done here. The latest version is really no different. What they've done, uh, as Councillor Flaherty pointed out, the, the legislative 
process that they're trying to use requires two uses. Their first draft failed to meet that requirement, so they've added a business use as a second use. What they've done is they've agreed to purchase the abandoned 99 restaurant, and they've come up with a plan, which is just that they hope somebody will lease that restaurant. This is, again, the original project design. Two buildings. What they've done in the most recent version is just lop off those two blue legs of the building there. So the buildings themselves are essentially unchanged. This is what the building looks like on the upper left. Um, as you can see, uh, as Councillor Flaherty pointed out, it's five stories. It's quite large. It's almost 60 feet. Um, and then in the bottom right, again, you see the footprint of the two buildings. And just to give you an idea of the scale, that red outline you see there is the footprint of the TD Garden. So these buildings together are almost twice the size of the TD Garden. Now what the process is supposed to be is that this, leg this draft legislation that's written by ZOM goes to the town council with a concept plan. The town council asks the planning board for a recommendation. Is this good legislation or is it not good legislation? Um, that's not really what's happening at the planning board. The planning board has discussed town budgets and their kids and other projects, but they have never, in all the time they've been discussing it, had a single conversation about or asked a single question about the actual zoning that's being proposed. Um, they're focusing a lot of attention on the concept plan, but again, this is a concept plan. It is not necessarily what's going to be built. As the director of planning likes to say time and time again, you cannot zone for a specific project. Once the zoning is in place, then the, develop, then the property owner gets to decide what they want to build there. Um, and, you know, the, the, the director of planning said quite clear, clearly now twice in their recommendation to the planning board, planning staff recommends the planning board issue an unfavorable recommendation. I am somewhat hopeful that there are a couple of members on the planning board that see this zoning for what it is and will give it an unfavorable recommendation. But that remains to be seen. The next meeting is August 8th. It is very important that everyone try to be there for the August 8th meeting. And it is very important that if you have an opinion on this project, you let the planning board and the town council know prior to August 8th. Here's why. Um, a couple of members of the planning board have indicated that they would like to see this go to a vote on August 8th. Now again, this is just a recommendation, but it's an important one. In the past, the planning board has used diminished participation in these meetings to suggest that, um, so let's say 400 people showed up for the first planning board meeting, and then 200 people showed up at the last meeting, they will say, see, not as many people are opposed to the new version of this project. So if you've written a letter or if you've gone to these meetings, it's really important that you write another letter and you show up to that next meeting on August 8th. Now, you have to wait before writing that letter because as I just said, if you write it now, it will be based on an old version of the project. Now, sometime between now and August 8th, there will be another revision to this project. We don't know exactly when. Um, hopefully, it's done in time so that everybody has a chance to read it and uh, actually take a vote on August 8th. So if you really want to do something now and you just can't wait, you could contact the mayor's office and ask that um, deadlines be put in place so that ZOM gets their material to the planning staff in a timely manner and the planning staff gets a response back to ZOM in a timely manner so that on August 8th, 
there's nothing left to be done but discuss the new revisions and take a vote on the project. Um, and I think that's just about it. Other than, again, August 8th, please, if you can, show up. Tell your neighbors to show up. Anything you can to um, make sure that everybody there knows that if you're still opposed to this project, that you are there and you are opposed to it. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. The, um, there are a lot of players in this process, including the planning board, including town council, including the mayor, but most importantly, including you. You don't show up. A lot of things happen when people don't show up. A lot of things are happening now because you are showing up. By the way, did you know that tonight, tonight, Braintree High has their prom. We're competing with a prom. Now, I will say, I don't have any kids that are going to the prom. And I guess a lot of you don't either. So we're good, maybe grandkids. My grandkids aren't that old yet. However, we're competing with that. We're competing with a lot of things. We're competing with laundry has to get done. Life has to happen. But you know what? This is a large part of Braintree. What happens on one side of Braintree can affect the other side of Braintree, which is one reason why I wanted Liz to come and share her thoughts. Um, because East Braintree and North Braintree have historically have had a very good relationship between the civic associations. I talked to Lee Dingy today. He says hi. Uh, by the way, wave to Lee. He's watching. Hi, Lee. Turn around, wave. wave. Uh, you don't have to turn around. It's OK. But uh, you know, Lee Dingy has been an integral part of the civic fabric and the political fabric over the last three or four decades. We have a lot of respect and a lot of appreciation for the East Braintree Civic Association support. They got started about the same time we did. We're going to transition now to the Master Plan uh, Steering Committee. And we're going to introduce, it's going to be a little uh, more interactive this time. Liz Page is on the Master Plan Steering Committee. Uh, she's going to run this segment along with Jen Wadlin. We are going to be asking for your feedback and your input, so get ready. This is not a time to just relax. You got to you got to pay attention here. I'm going to add one more thing. 1978 when the Civic Association started, it started with a group of people who were actually opposed to what was happening at the plaza. How ironic that is, right? One of them is here tonight, and that is Mr. John Heron. Thank you, John Heron, for setting the pace and starting this whole thing going. With that, Liz Page. Hi, thank you. And where is Jen? Okay, Jen, do you want to read the, um, the rating system? Okay. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to be conducting a survey. And um, the master plan, if you can go back one, please, Steve. The Braintree master plan will be a 10-year vision and roadmap for Braintree's future. The plan will be the foundational policy document for the town, guiding local decisions about future growth, preservation, and change. There will be many opportunities for community members to help to shape the master plan, and we hope that you will share your ideas along the way. Okay. So tonight, we will be talking about some strategies, and the strategies will be formulated to fit certain vision statements. So I will read a vision statement, and then I will read strategies that will either, in your opinion, be good, valid strategies to fit that vision, or you might not like the strategies at all, or you might say, I like the strategy, but 
it needs to be tweaked a little bit. So we're going to go through a scale that Jen will explain, and um, we will ask you to raise your hands through the process. It, it is a little bit time consuming, and so we will try and go as quickly as possible. So Jen, if you would like to read the... Um, okay. So this is how the rating system works. And so Amy's on this side, and she's going to record how many of you say you're a one, how many of you say you're a two, three, four, and a five. But how it works is, if you're a one, you hate this strategy. You want it to be removed. You don't like it at all. If you're a two, you might be, you know, you like it a little bit, you're on the, you're on the fence. If you're a three, you are somewhat okay with the strategy, but would like to see some major edits. And number four, you're generally okay. You're, you're like, okay, that makes sense. And if you're a five, you absolutely love the strategy. So we're going to ask you two questions about a strategy. The first question will be, do you support it? So you can support it, sorry. But then we're going to ask you, should it be a priority? So I might think every new town facility should be renovated. That could be my strategy. <laughs> every, every single fire station police. But could it be a priority? Like, would we really have the money for it? Or you don't even have to get it in that deep with yourself, but would it be a priority? So, so I'm going to ask you two questions for each strategy. Do you support it? And, and one through five, so one being the worst. And should the town make it a priority? One being no, five being absolutely. So we'll try to run through these quickly because I feel like, thank you for sticking it out with us and thank you for giving the feedback, but we'll kind of run through it quickly. So if we, if I say now everyone who's a one, if you could just raise your hand, Amy's going to count this side and I'm going to count this side. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. And Liz is going to roll so, the vision and then the strategy. I will read you the vision statement for core theme four. Enhance community vitality with careful and strategic growth policies that preserve, protect, and improve in existing residential neighborhoods. Plan and supply a diverse range of compatibly scaled and well-designed housing options that harmonize with the surrounding con context of the neighborhood, including affordable housing options that address the needs of the community. The first strategy, A, explore the acquisition of wooded areas in residential neighborhoods to preserve buffers from incompatible uses. Want to come over here? I'm always in trouble without this mic. Okay. <laughs> Raise your hand if you're a two. And, and if people don't vote your way, it's okay to like be totally different. Okay. Raise your hand if you're a two on this. Three. Four, you generally like the idea. Okay, and then five. You think it's a great idea. You think it's a great idea, okay. Okay. Okay, now staying with that same vision, the next one is identify opportunities. Oh, I'm sorry, we've got to do we, the priority. So that we have to now ask if you think it should be a priority. Sorry. So. I know, you're jumping ahead of me. Okay, so you don't think it should be a priority, would be a one. So is anyone a one? Okay. Anyone a two? Three? Four? And five. Okay, next one. 
Okay. On the next one, identify opportunities to support housing specifically for veterans in Braintree. Okay. Ones, raise your hand. You do not support this idea. Two, on the fence. Three, generally like it. Four. Okay. Five. Okay, got it. Okay. Prior priority. Should this be a priority in town to create veterans housing? So one, do not support it being a priority. Two, and I know this is a little redundant, but this is unfortunately the way they've set it up, so I don't have, I didn't do it this way. Two, anyone a two? Anyone a three? Fours? And five. Okay, next one. The next one, amend zoning requirements to strengthen protections for neighborhoods that abut potential developments by A, increasing neighborhood buffers to a minimum of 150 feet, B, limiting vehicular and pedestrian access to already established neighborhoods. C, ensure, ensuring appropriate size, scale, and design of new buildings that do not detract from the already established neighborhood. That's sort of what Julia was re referring to. So anyone a one? one? Anyone a two? Anyone a three? Anyone? Oh, hold on. Can you do a three, three again? You a three, one. Anyone a four? Anyone a five? Okay. Ooh. Okay, should it be a priority? Do you feel like you're all voting the same exact way with the priorities and the support? Like honestly, you do. All right, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna skip it because I feel like it's, it, every, does anyone disagree? Does anyone feel like they might be voting a totally different way? Okay, all right, why don't we go to the next one? Because okay. I think time is okay. Implement strategies for workforce housing production, such as employer-assisted housing, tax incentives for workforce housing, leveraging publicly owned surplus land for workforce housing, or pursuing state funding to support workforce housing. Anyone? Threes. Four. Five. Okay, next. Consider community-supported refinements to the zoning bylaw to promote 
apartment-style residential and mixed-use zoning. Refinements should recognize the reality of parcel sizes, should be compatibly scaled, and should consider site access. One. I'm sorry, do you want me to repeat that? Yeah. Okay, sure. Consider community-supported refinements to the zoning bylaw to promote apartment-style residential and mixed-use zoning. Refinements should recognize the reality of parcel sizes, should be compatibly scaled, and should consider site access. Okay, was uh, anyone a one that wants to take away their one vote? Does anyone want to add to their one? Do you want to add? And be a one, one, two, three, six. Okay. Eight. Okay. Anyone? Okay. No. Okay. Two. Encourage more. Oh. I'm so, oh, jeez. I'm sorry. I'm trying to rush through it. Encourage more small-scale housing options and create opportunities for multi-generational housing by allowing detached accessory dwelling units, parentheses, EU, by right in residence A and B districts. Yes, so he's just asking for clarification on that, and that would allow more density to housing lots in residence A and B neighborhoods. Okay, is any one? Okay, lot. Well, okay. Anyone a two? Anyone else a two? No. Okay. Were you a two? No. Okay. Anyone a three? Anyone a four? Anyone a five? When developing housing regulations, policies, or programs include a broader representation of community members, in particularly those most impacted by the decision-making process. Do you want me to repeat that? Yeah. I'm sorry. Explain. Okay, when developing housing regulations, policies, or programs. So, in other words, when you're developing these kind of rules and regulations, it talks about involving more people from the community in the process because these are the people that are most impacted by the process. Almost like the Zon project. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Ones, any ones? Any twos? Any th threes? Any fours?
Any fives? Okay, so the majority. Okay. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, next. Okay, next we're moving on to the next vision statement. Protect, enhance, and conserve water and other natural resources. Expand protected open space. Strengthen climate resilience. Preserve historic resources and promote social vitality for a sustainable community with a strong connection to the natural world and its historic roots. The first strategy we will discuss is identify locations for land acquisition to increase conservation land area, particularly in East and North Braintree as outlined in the most current open space and recreation plan. Um, a Braintree 2018 Open Space and Recreation Plan and the CPC land acquisition. Okay, so ones, two, three, four, Five. Okay. Go okay, next one. Explore hosting open street days in Braintree Square and South Braintree Square or permanently closing the roads to traffic one day per week. So that is to um, make Braintree Square or South Braintree Square more of like a walking type shop, restaurant type thing. Some communities do that where they might have traffic one way on say on Sunday afternoons or um, they might close off the streets altogether so that the restaurants could do outdoor seating. Those are just examples. Like to support the, the square business. Like I was just in Carlsbad, California and they shut down one day a week for like a farmer's market and, it, and the shops get a lot of traffic. So that was the thought behind it. Um, so, but you decide what you think. So one, lots of ones, okay. Two. Three. Four. Five. Oh, were you a four or a five? All right. <laughs> Okay. Anyone else a five? Okay. Consider increasing the Community Preservation Act surcharge, which is currently 1%, to fund the town's open space, recreation, historic preservation, and community housing goals.
Okay, we're moving on to the next theme. Pursue strategic economic development that is respectful of surrounding land uses, promotes local business, repurposes developed sites that are blighted or underutilized, supports vibrant commercial squares, protects existing and revitalizes business areas. The first strategy we will consider is create a community supported plan envisioning the transformation of South Shore Plaza site by establishing priorities for new or redevelopment, example, healthcare or bio incubator, um, a Burlington Mall district plan, that type of thing, as in Burlington. and five. Okay. Amend the use table in the town's zoning bylaw to include unique business models or industry sectors more prevalent in the 21st century, such as brew breweries and distilleries, shared kitchen facilities, co-working spaces, production spaces with a retail component, maker spaces, cold storage facilities, high bay warehousing, last mile delivery facilities, life science R&D, and life science manufacturing. Amend Town Traffic Ordinance Article 14 to ensure that the size, scale, and level of impact introduced by the project are fully considered when determining appropriate mitigation for a proposed development. Example, fee per new trip generated. I'm not quite sure what that means. Okay. No. <laughs> What's that? Yes. Okay, so we're going to try and help out. Amend the town traffic ordinance to ensure. Okay, so they want um, the ordinance which would measure the traffic and how it is acceptable for a project being considered be amended to. Um, fully considered determining the appropriate mitigation for the proposed development. So what things must be done to mitigate and offset the traffic if it's acceptable. So if a developer develops, you know, could they change the light, the, the light cycles? They could change the light cycles or... Um, uh, well, this is saying you that say? you need to consider the size and the scale and the level of impact introduced by the project, that those are being fully considered when the mitigation is being considered. Erin has a comment. She, she was on the planning board. She might be able to say. Oh. Amend, amend the zoning. Right. Right. 
I can uh, just add what, what trip generation is, what a new trip generation is. So let's say you have a vacant parcel um, of trees and uh, Walmart's coming in. And the new trips associated, so every time a car visits the Walmart, that's one trip. So if a project is changing the number of trips or vehicles that are visiting the site, this example would say, okay, when that Walmart comes in, there's 3,000 new trips a day. The town is going to assign a fee for each of those trips and collect that fee. So essentially any project that's adding vehicles to the site, using the site, you're going to charge them a fee per trip. So it's a way to generate monies for the town associated with a project that would be increasing traffic, just as an example. Thank you. So, okay, so we'll, does that answer it or do you need, no, not really. Do you want to skip? All right, we're okay. going to, okay, we're going to skip. <laughs> okay, we're going to the next we'll one. We'll move on to the next okay. Upgrade roadway corridors and transportation infrastructure to improve safety for all users, reduce neighborhood cut-through traffic, prioritize pedestrian access, and support alternative modes of transportation, such as bicycles and shuttles, and produce better connectivity between the two sides of the highway to help people safely get around town and the region. That's the vision statement where thinking about with these following strategies. First one, designate truck routes to reduce truck traffic through residential neighborhoods. One, you hate it. <laughs> You're gonna hate it. Two, you on the fence? Anyone on the fence? Okay. Okay. We're, we're moving right along. There are not that many left. Okay, next. There's just like five, four more. Implement regulations to discourage cut through traffic, such as closing roads to local traffic only and changing direction of travel to one way only. I think this next one we'll all understand. Work with state and federal agencies to address critical traffic congestion and safety issues at the Braintree Split and the Union Street Traffic Rotary, as well as related impacts on local roadway network. We're in the home stretch. <laughs> this is the last section. Prioritize fiscal planning and implementation for new 
expanded and modernized town facilities and infrastructure, especially public school infrastructure, including services and sound maintenance thereof. The first strategy, conduct facility needs assessments for all applicable town-owned buildings to identify all capital needs, including ADA, deferred maintenance, and a prioritized schedule for improvements. One. <laughs> Two. Three. Four. Five. Okay. We have five minutes, I've been told. Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna zoom through this last one. Plan for the construction of a new high school. New high school, hate the idea. Two, two, three, four, five. Okay, I think that's the last one we can do. Okay. Because of our time constraints. Yes. Thank you okay. all for your feedback, and this will all go into the, the master plan planning process, and thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Wow. We have four people in this room who sit, five, who sit on this committee. If you are on the Master Plan Steering Committee, please stand, just stand. One already is, two, three, four, and Julia, and she just stepped out. Awesome job. I know that was probably the most fun part of tonight. Um, a couple things, first of all, we have applications to join. If you want an application, gentlemen, the front's up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shamelessly, I said. Uh, and you get a free sticker if you get, uh, get an application, unless you don't want one. A um, couple things, upcoming meetings. So tomorrow night, we have a meeting back here regarding the St. Thomas More project. The St. Thomas More property has been sold, and there is going to be a meeting with the contractor, the developer, uh, here tomorrow. And I know Councillor Reynolds is going to be chairing that meeting. That's going to be right here tomorrow at 7 o'clock, 6.30. She always corrects me. It's just because I'm always wrong. Um, I also want to... Um, come on, Barry. A uh, couple things more. Uh, sexiest hat in the room goes right over there, Ron. He's the only one wearing a hat. And sexiest socks in the room right over here, ex-counselor John Mullaney, former counselor John Mullaney. You got to hold him up a little bit, John. Never mind. Next Monday, we've got a meeting on the Clean Harbors project with the mayor. And where is that? Is that here? Or anybody know where that is? It's at East. At what time? Seven? Monday, 7 o'clock, uh, we're going to have uh, State Representative Timothy, uh, a, a whole slew of others. And they're going to be there, and I'm quite certain someone else will be there, Ms. Maglio, holding their feet to the fire. Okay, so that's what this is all about. So if you want to attend that, because 
we have nothing else to do but go to these types of meetings. Um, what else, Liz? Anything else I need to say up here? Come to the meeting on August 8th. What meeting is that? Oh, the planning board meeting, August 8th. Where will that be? Right here. And they're not going to change it to east, we anticipate this time. That being said, if you want to adjourn this meeting, one, two, three, four, five, meeting adjourned. Thank you. If you want to sign, sign up back there. We have plenty of signs.